Shri-Sri-Radha-Krishna-Gop-Kopinath-Sham-Gunaradha-Krishna-Gop-Kopinath-Sham-Gunaradha-Krishna-Gop-Kopinath-Sham-Gunaradha-Krishna-Gop-
Very good. Well, are there any other blessed topics today? Raj Bihari says yes. Let's hear I could just say it. Yeah. Raj, um, I just noticed. Uh, um, what am I? I'm reading. Uh, I guess I'm reading Bhagavad Gita right now. Mm. And I see that Srila Prabhupada is quoting quite a bit, a mo much more than I had suspected, but I notice it now more than ever, quoting Upanishads <clears throat> and, and Ved you know, Vedas in general. Um, and, you know, we kind of know that Upanishads aren't really super personalistic. Um, yet Prabhupada seems to, per well, of course, he may be, uh, you would know better than, much better than me, you know, if he's, if this is coming from, you know, Vala David Yabusan or Vishnu Shakhbar Thakur, but it seems like it's a very conscious choice to even in kind of include the Upanishads when making the points about personalism and, and certainly translating them in a way that points towards personalism. And I just wonder if you have any insights into that. Uh, you know, um, either Prabhupada or our previous Acharyas kind of almost seems to sometimes go out of their way to include Upanishad quotes in, um, you know, in 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 a book in a book that their their commentaries are focused on on Krishna the person. Okay, good good question. Uh, why the 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 stress on the Upanishads and in, in the commentaries, Bhagavad Gita especially. And is Prabhupada getting this from Baladev or elsewhere? So first of all, yes, Prabhupada is uh, very much following the commentary of Srila Baladev Yabhushan, who does quote these Upanishadic sources. Uh, there are several reasons we could give. One is that Shruti is considered a very authoritative source. If, if, you, can quote, if you can quote, there are those who will accept Smriti but everyone has to accept Shruti, uh, even the, the, those who, who will only accept the Vedas will accept the Upanishads. Um, and then they'll consider Purana, yeah, maybe, whatever. <laughs> so if you can quote the, the Upanishads, then you've got everybody. That's one, one point. Mm. Uh, another point is that the Bhagavad Gita very much follows or very much um, speaks to um, the Upanishads, especially when you look at chapter, um, elsewhere also, but when you look at the second chapter, you really see there's almost a, 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 a dialogue, an echo of the uh, Upanishads in, in Bhagavad Gita, which of course Prabhupada introduces as Gita Upanishad. Gita Upanishad, the essence of the, the Upanishads. So that was Prabhupada's original title for the book, in fact, was Gita Upanishad. Uh, the subtitle was Bhagavad Gita as it is. So in this Bhagavad Gita, the essence of the Upanishads, there's very much a, 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 uh, a consciousness of the Upanishads, we can say. Um, I've been working with my grand disciple Vasudev on a rendering of Katu Upanishad into uh, English. And a lot of, of uh, crosstalk is going on there between Katu Upanishad and the, the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and uh, also I should add that Katu Upanishad is very strong personal focus. Uh, nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitanam. There's there's a lot of uh, more than that. That there's a lot of places in, in the Katu Upanishad where impersonal explanations really don't work very well at all. The personalistic focus is is present. Is that okay? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Could I um. I'd like to add a little something to that. Um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, when he was at Radha Kund, he spoke on the Upanishads mm -hmm. and was criticized for it. They're like, you're at Radha Kund 
and you're speaking on the Upanishads rather than, you know, the transcendental pastimes of Radha and Krishna. So he he spoke on that, chose that as well. Yeah, it's a, a very good point. The the Upanishads are very strong on on clarifying the difference between matter and spirit, on on separating the the living being from matter, on on realizing our distinct identity as as spirit souls so which is very much the focus again in, in the second chapter of bhagavad gita and in, in other places as well so we're we're not what would you say anti upanishadic or or strangers to the upanishads there's there's a lot of common ground here that's being traversed thank you for that uh, Kamoni. anything else on, on this subject Okay, other subjects, other, again, you're, you're, you can raise your hand, you can, you can just speak up, you can type into the chat box, and Chaitanya Bhava's got a hand there. So let's, yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, um, so we were reading uh, this uh, purport today in the Srimad Bhagavatam reading, uh, it's in 2.636. Um, and there, um, Sri Prabhupada writes in the purport that Brahma is the father of the father of Manu, um, who is the father of mankind all over the universal planet. So basically the point was Manu is the father of mankind all over the universal planet. So somebody was asking that um, we find mankind only on this planet. So uh, how is it that there is, you know, He's the father of mankind over all universal planets. I don't really know. The mankind may be more broadly defined than just the kind of man that we know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't really have much of a much yeah. to say about and, it. And I'm in that reading group too. And um, what does that mean, the father father of mankind? Does it mean that he was a beginning a progenitor? I know there's like a Manu Samhita where he gives, um, you know, direction, but then there's 14 Manus in a day of Brahma. So this must uh, re be referring to a particular um, Manu because in this um, particular section, it's Lord Brahma speaking to Narada and telling him, you know, how, no, I'm not the Supreme. There is a Supreme beyond me and we can only know him, you know, through his mercy. He said, I can't even know him. And, um, you know, I'm uh, supposedly, he's so respected for his great intelligence and all of that. So, so um, th does it mean like a kind of a post Manu or is he speaking of a specific Manu? And um, yeah, what exactly is the function of a Manu? Uh, yeah, the, the Manu is part of the, um, and many, he's the, you could say, chief administrator during a particular time. These Manvantaras are the 14 periods where Manu is in charge. And along with Manu, there's a whole, there's an Indra, there's the, uh, what is it, the seven sages, there's a whole uh, group of senior, uh, what would you say? Um, administrators. Uh, in the uh, universal affairs, the, so Manu is, is one of them. And yes, he's in charge of, of, what would you say, expanding the, the human society. I, I really haven't thought about this, this topic. If somebody wants to do some research on it and bring it back, you're, you're welcome. Is that okay? Maharaj, I, was just, uh, I was just searching about it. And uh, in one letter by Srila Prabhupada, um, to Rupa, Rupa Nuga, he says, the demigods are included within the species of human life. Okay, question answered. <laughs> asked, asked and answered. 
Okay, Suman had a question. And let me put it in the in the chat box for everyone. Um before we go on to a new topic, could we just explore this a little more? Yeah. So Karshan <laughs> asks who the seven sages are. Okay. Uh, I forget who they are. Brigu is one of them. And there's there's others. Somebody certainly Hari Parshan would would, you know, without even thinking about it, would, would rattle off their names. Um, but they're they're senior sages in, in the universe. We could, you could look them up, and you know, they're not hard to find. They're just not um, in my memory. They're mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam. I'm sorry. Uh, then Kamalini, you wanted to. Um, um, oh yeah. Um, I was hearing recently. I can't remember exactly. But um, about the species of life, it said it's not just um, like if there's 400,000 species, we generally think like um, due to geographical location and that means particular bodily features, you know, white or brown skin and things like that. But, um, but a species, it goes according to one's like uh, intelligence and qualities. It could be kind of... Um, like within the Varnashram system, those are considered different species, something like that. So it's quite um, elaborate, and uh, I don't know any anybody yeah. knows more details. Uh, Jalaja Navalakani, there, there's this many forms of life. Now, exactly what it, how that corresponds to species, or what species means in that context, is open for research and discussion please it's not quite i haven't anywhere seen it precisely defined but there are different forms of life something else okay let's come to suman's question let me paste it in okay sent it to my chat box okay let me expand so i can see this I was reading Srinivas Bhagavatam 1.7, I guess that's Kunti Devi's prayers, and came across this deep purport. Revival of the dormant affection or love of Godhead does not depend on the mechanical system of hearing and chanting, but it solely and wholly depends on the causeless mercy of the Lord. When the Lord is fully satisfied with the sincere efforts of the devotee, the Lord may endow him with his loving transcendental service. But even with the prescribed forms of hearing and chanting, there is at once the superfluous and unwanted miseries of material existence. Such mitigation of material affection does not wait for development of transcendental knowledge. Rather, knowledge is dependent on devotional service for the ultimate realization of the supreme truth. With respect to neophytes, can you make me understand the process of cultivating knowledge in devotion and the graduation from mechanical chanting to loving chanting. So the process of cultivating knowledge in devotion is essentially the process we're following. The uh, hearing, chanting, associating with devotees, uh, sadhu sangha, uh, serving the deity, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, chanting Hare Krishna, living in Vrindavan or a place that has the Vrindavan atmosphere. There are 64 items of devotional service of which these are principal. And 
Chaneyat Yashu Vairagyam Ganam Chayyadavaitakam, along with, with devotional service, knowledge will follow. Prabhupada says that the uh, knowledge is dependent on devotional service for the ultimate realization of the supreme truth. So the, yes, but then Suman says, but Prabhupada's saying we're ultimately a mercy case. Yes, Giraj Maharaj said that also, we're all mercy cases. So, but that mercy is not, of course, can be just indiscriminately distributed. The Lord can give mercy to whomever he wishes. But uh, generally, the Lord gives mercy when he sees that someone is sincerely approaching him with the devotional mood. The Lord sees that someone's approaching him. Please let me serve you. Please let me serve you. And Krishna says, yes, come on. So uh, the beginning, that process of knowledge, uh, the beginning is shraddha, to have some faith in the topics of Krishna consciousness or the association of Krishna consciousness, then to associate with devotees, sadhu sangha, then in the association of devotees to accept the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master and perform the different methods of sadhana, uh, then by performing those methods, especially hearing, chanting, and so on, uh, the unwanted things in the heart are uh, cast out. Uh, then uh, mm -hmm. it goes on in, in that way. Um, one gets a a, a, a taste, one gets a strong attachment for Krishna, one comes to the stage of ecstasy, one comes to the stage of love for Krishna. There's a, a, a progression. But Prabhupada's point here is that, that the hearing, and you're asking seems to be about this, that our process seems to be mechanical hearing and chanting, chant 16 rounds, uh, but that Mechanical hearing and chanting is the beginning. Uh, what we're advised to uh, chant with feeling and to chant with, with a, a single-minded attention. So that, that process uh, develops. The, the japa is to be chanted with, with attention, avoiding uh, 10 kinds of offenses. That's quality in chanting. And even more important, we find in, in Brihad Bhagavatamrita than the, the japas, the sankirtan, where one's natural feelings for Krishna will, will develop. Prophecy, even a child begins to uh, dance along with the chanting. So there's nothing, what would you say, um, no secret doors here where you, there's something we haven't disclosed. And if you search hard enough, you'll find it. It's all out there in the open. We just have to take it. The, the process itself, in the beginning, uh, vaidhi bhakti, vaidhi means more or less mechanical or out of obedience to, to orders we hear, we chant. But by following that system sincerely, our hearts become purified and then we come to the uh, next stage where there's more spontaneous attraction to Krishna. And that, uh, yes, that spontaneous attraction or that, uh, yes, uh, becomes more, more powerful for bringing us toward uh, Krishna. Or looking at it, at it from, Yes, this is sort of a, um, a schematic overview. From another point of view, you can look at it and say that it's our sincere desire. Rupa Goswami says it's just the price is your eagerness to have it. So someone without any, what would you say, um, sophistication or anything, but he, 
he comes into the association of devotees because he's uh, sincerely looking for, for Krishna, sincerely looking for spiritual life. And in the association of the devotees, he, he picks up uh, this, this jewel of Krishna consciousness and he's so eager to, to, to have this. And he's that kind of eagerness, that kind of sincerity, that desire to serve the spiritual master. So sometimes we find that, that someone's not very um, intellectual or not very philosophical, maybe not even very strong in, in renunciation, but he's attached to serving the spiritual master. That becomes the, the cause, the, a source of causeless mercy. Uh, of course, causeless mercy is causeless. It's not dependent on, on anything, but one can uh, in, in, invite and hope for the, the causeless mercy of the Lord. I hope that's okay. Would, would someone like to add to that? Um, let's see, let's see. I, I could try, <laughs> try to say something. Um, the, uh, the, the experiences that I have, that ha there's help, Krishna sends help in different ways. Um, it's not just by my own endeavor. Like I have some desire to develop my Krishna consciousness and then Krishna sends help other people, sometimes challenging situations. And then in this way, I'm sort of prodded along to go in the direction of Krishna. And it can be very challenging uh, experiences, sometimes embarrassing or whatever. But I see, at least in my own case, that it's Krishna sending me what I need at the time. Mm. Yes, and the causeless, we think of causeless mercy like one day we're just flooded with love or something like that. But causeless mercy can be like a, a kick in the pants. You know, Krishna uh, swats us or Krishna takes something away from us or Krishna makes things, makes life difficult for us. And we think, what is Krishna doing? And, and what am I doing wrong? And whatever. Or Krishna, don't do this to me or whatever. But it's Krishna's mercy. He's, there's a, a verse in Bhagavatam. Now, let me think which one it is. The, oh, I think it's that verse, Yasyaham uh, Anugranami, Bharishay Tatanam Shanai, where the Acharyas say in their purports that Krishna knows what each candidate needs, what each aspiring devotee needs. So someone needs to have everything taken away from him. Someone needs to have something uh, given to him. Something, someone needs this or someone needs that. So it's sort of tailor-made for, for the case. It's not just indiscriminate or one size fits all kind of mercy, but mercy comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, sometimes unrecognized even, uh, sometimes even unrecognized. Thank you for that. Nice to understand. So, Suman asks, real chanting happens after anartha nivritti. Well, you can say more advanced chanting because even the neophytes chanting on the stage of, of uh, Shraddha and Bhajana Kriya in, in its early stages it is real. We wouldn't say it's not real, but uh, it's more mature when it comes to an art and vritti, and then it becomes nishta, uh, strong, strong faith develops, and, and so on. So at every stage, devotional service is real from, from day one, but it becomes more mature, more mature, more mature. Probably gives the example of the um, unripe mango and the ripe mango. At every stage, it's mango, but when it's ripe, then you taste it. And it's more appreciated. More on, on this? The, the Tina says, I've read a lot that Vaidhi Bhakti does not lead to Raghunuga Bhakti. From your explanation, it sounds like it does. Can you explain? I've read that they're two, two completely different, different processes. 
and thus destination is also different. Thank you. The, mm, Vaidhi Bhakti. Yes, Vaidhi Bhakti will lead to more spontaneous. If you just stick with Vaidhi Bhaktis, that's for them, that's everything. It's all rules and regulations. It's all awe and reverence. It's all, um, yes, um, very respectful uh, relationship with the Lord. So that's the Vaikuntha uh, mood. And the devotee who cultivates that kind of devotion can go to Vaikuntha and eternally serve in that, that mood, where everything is very much according to rules. But if one is desiring more uh, spontaneous, more spontaneous relationship with Krishna, then that will come if by, uh, of course, not just by following the rules, it requires mercy as we've been discussing, but that will come. The, the, in the beginning, he's chanting according to rules. He's chanting 16 rounds. He's getting up from Mangalarti. He's worshiping the deity. He's, he's hearing Bhagavatam, attending the Bhagavatam class. These are also uh, mighty sadhana. Vaidhi doesn't just mean um, respectful worship, but it means doing things that we have to do or doing things because we have to do them. So we're all uh, doing that. We wake up early in the morning, we attend the Bhagavatam class, we chant 16 rounds, we follow four regular principles. At least that's our, our path. We're either doing that or aspiring to do that. Um, so that's Vaidhi, from Vidhi. Vidhi means rules. But uh, what is the advanced kind of practice? It's the same thing. It's chanting, it's Sankirtan. It's hearing Bhagavatam. It's worshiping the deity. The same things. It's not that it's at a certain point, there's a whole different path. It's the same thing. But the advanced devotees, they're hearing Bhagavatam, not because Guru Maharaj said we have to go to Bhagavatam class, but they're relishing. They're looking forward to it. They're uh, hearing with, with rapt attention. They're hearing with with appreciation. They're hearing even with love when they, they hear these feelings of Krishna, they're maybe overwhelmed how wonderful Krishna is. So it's not a, a, a different path, but the aspiration is there uh, and the enthusiasm is there, particularly when one is under the guidance of a pure devotee who's leading one on that path the path of, of devotional service, Sri Chaitanya Manopistam Sthapitam Jena Bhuta, the path of devotional service taught by Lord Chaitanya and expanded by the Goshamas. When one is under the guidance of a pure devotee and aspiring in that mood, then he makes advancement by this same method. Uh, the only difference, even we see, you look at the Goswamis, what are they doing? Krishna Kirtana Gana Lotanaparo, Asankya Purvaka Nama Gana TV. They're chanting a prescribed number of rounds. They're doing Sankirtan. Uh, but in what consciousness? In what consciousness? They're doing the same thing. We're worshiping the deity in the temple. Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, we're worshiping their deities. Raghunath Das Goswami, they're all, they're all doing uh, Seva Puja, but in what, with what realization, with what feeling? And when they were chanting, when Haridas Thakur was chanting, what was his chanting and what is our chanting? So it's, it's the same business, but mature. And then there's, let's see, I can skip a comment or come, come to it later. Aren't we all following Vaidhi Bhakti right now? Yes. But the, the same one devotee is following 
say attending Bhagavatam class because that's what you're supposed to do. Temple commander says, if I don't attend Bhagavatam class, I, I, I can't have, I, I can't sit down for, for, for breakfast prasad. You have to attend the class. All right, I'll attend the class. Or he just knows it's expected. I have to attend the class. But I, I remember I was stationed in London for some time at Soho Street. And there was one elderly Gujarati gentleman who used to come for the morning class. And the devotees would be sitting for the class and they'd be hearing and be usual. But this uh, gentleman, he, would, he was just seemed to be you know, glued to the set, as they say, you know, he was just really uh, focused on hearing the Bhagavatam. And I can see that he was reading Prabhupada's books because he would sort of click into to the verses and even have other verses that were uh, relevant. And he, when he'd hear them, he'd, he'd, he'd be appreciating. And, and, you know, it was a different kind of, of, of hearing. And some of the devotees thought, oh, that, that old man just comes to, you know, he just comes for prasada. But I could see that he had a real taste for hearing uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, that's why he, he was there, not because someone told him you have to attend the class, or this is one of the five more, five most important methods of sadhana. He, he had a real taste for it. So that was our uh, Mahavishnu Goswami. Uh, that was our Mahavishnu Goswami who went on to have a wonderful career of devotional service and, and preaching. So it's the same Bhagavatam but how much taste is there? Suman says, isn't mercy flowing in all the stages, therefore we advance? Yes, yes. Just to be in the association of devotees, how, how much mercy that is. And all the, after, after lifetimes and lifetimes, we get the association of devotees. How much mercy? We get the... Uh, association of a bona fide spiritual master and become connected, how much mercy that is. We get the, the holy name of Krishna. We get uh, Mahaprasad. We get the darshan of, of the deity, Radha and Krishna. We, get, we hear Bhagavatam. This is all mercy. We're, we're uh, surrounded by mercy. We get to go to some place like Mayapur, Vrindavan, even to a temple of, of, you know, in a place like Philadelphia or, or Atlanta, or, uh, San Diego, Moscow. It's all mercy. It's all mercy. Then there's a, a comment posted by Praveen. Let me just get it in my funny. In this Manvantara, O King, Eighth Canto, the Adityas, the Vasus, the Rudras, the Vishvedevas, the Marups, the two Ashwini Kumar brothers, and the Ribhus are the demigods. Their head king, Indra, is Purandara. Kashyapa, Atri, Vishishta, Vishamritra, Gautam, Shamadagni, and Paradvaj are known as the seven sages. Just see, not even Brigley. Uh, Kashyap, Atri, Vishishta, Vishamritra, Gautam, Shamanagni, and Bharadvaj. So there are your seven sages. Okay, thank you for that, Praveen. Much appreciated. Are there other, uh, Tulsi Priya had a comment. Yes, Maharaj, thank you very much. Um, I was just thinking when you were talking about the difference between Vaidhi Bhakti and, and Sadhana Bhakti, I mean, um, sorry, my brain is not uh, going to the word. Um, I was reminded of the very, almost right at the very beginning of Prabhupada's preface to the Bhagavad Gita as it is, 
where he says our Krishna consciousness movement is genuine, historically authorized, natural, and transcendental due to its being based on Bhagavad Gita as it is. And it was uh, that always struck me that Prabhupada says it's natural. And, and to me, that means you can look at a lot of how things work in the material world or in life and, and see that you can apply certain principles to how Krishna consciousness works. So when we talk about, you know, developing spontaneous attraction, almost nothing is, is spontaneous, you know, spontaneously, um, no one is spontaneously expert at anything to begin with. They have to start off from a period of, from a point of ignorance or, or inexperience and they work towards it. Uh, and, and, and that's natural. And there's another um, uh, example Prabhupada gives in the Chaitanya Charitamrita and the Madhya Lila, where he compares Vaidhi Bhakti and Sadhana Bhakti, the progression to typing, how at first you have to consult the typing manual, and then through practice, you gradually become fluent in your typing, which I thought was just, you know, such an expert um, mm. example. Um, I, I personally always compare it to, you know, somebody who's like an Olympic, Olympic athlete, nobody becomes an expert gymnast or whatever, or an ice skater, the moment they get out on the ice or the moment they get on the balance beam, they work at it. But yet when they, they work and, and they go through the austerities and they practice and practice and practice, when the moment comes, they seem to be just flying like a bird and it looks completely natural, but it's anything but to get to that point. And yet, you know that they're natural at it because they can do it at will. Um, it's just a matter of the level of perfection that they attain when the, when the moment, when it counts. So it's just something that I was thinking about. It just it always struck me those those two examples that Prabhupada gives. Yeah. With practice, it comes out. Right. But it's natural. But but it's natural with practice. Right. Nice, nice point. Thank you. There's another question from Praveen, no, sorry, from Sumon. Um, Prabhupada says, Lord Balaram or Lord Nityananda is Sevak Bhagavan and manifestation of service attitude in devotion. On the other hand, Srimati Radharani is the source of Bhakti Shakti or loving devotion. Similarly, it is said, spiritual master is manifestation of Lord Balaram, but in Sangsara Dava, we find he is eternal servitor of gopis, assisting Srimati Radharani. Can you help me understand these two tattvas? Yes, Srila Prabhupada in one place says that the bona fide spiritual master is considered a representative of Lord Balaram or the word Nitanda or of Srimati Radharani. It's not only one possibility is there. Lord Balaram or Lord Nityananda is considered the original spiritual master. So from that point of view, the spiritual master represents Lord Balaram or Lord Nityananda. And Srimati Radharani is the pleasure potency of the Lord, uh, the personification, you can say, or the, the epitome of devotional service. So the spiritual master is the representative of Srimati Radharani, who invests the devotee with the potency to give pleasure to Krishna and receive pleasure from Krishna. So the, both things are, are, are simultaneously true. We have that often in devotional service where um, it's not only one way of looking at things that's legitimate or, or authoritative or uh, accepted, but looked at one way, it's this way, looked at that um, from another point of view, it's that way. So the spiritual master uh, represents Nityananda Prabhu, Balaram, or he represents Srimati Radharani, both, both are there. Anything else here? Comments, questions? Marat, so is devotion coming from both Lord Nityananda and Radharani? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Nitananda, uh, who's eternally joyful <clears throat> devotional service. And Radharani is the, the, the bhakti uh, personified. So the it's coming this way and that way. It's coming this way and that way. Lord Balaram is Krishna, finally. So Krishna is giving us devotional service. Radharani is giving us devotional service. The spiritual master is representing Radha Krishna. He's giving us devotional service. So it's coming. It's not that, well, wait a second. I thought that Radharani was the only source of devotional service. How can you get devotional service from Nityananda? This seems contradictory. It's not like that. <laughs> Is that okay? Yes, Maharaj. So therefore, Gornita and uh, worshipping Gornita and Radha Krishna are simultaneously same. Is it something like Shri that? Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahiyanya. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Radha Krishna together, combined, you can say, or, or is Krishna in the mood of Srimati Radharani? So we're where uh, what what can you say? We're seeking mercy through these different channels. We're uh, approaching Radha Krishna uh, by the mercy of Nitananda Prabhu. Uh, to approach Srimati Radharani is not a small thing. Uh, to chant Hare Krishna, oh Radharani, oh Krishna, not a small thing. So that becomes possible by uh, the grace of Guru Tattva by the strength and mercy of Nityananda Prabhu and Balaram. So everything is, everything is working for us. Uh, Krishna is helping us. Radharani is helping. Everyone is ready to help us. We just have to want to be helped. Is that okay? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank mm -hmm. you, Maharaj, very much. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, when I saw uh, Athena's question, if I'm pronouncing her name right, um, you you answered the question so wonderfully in the in the um, kind of the general idea of going from rules to spontaneity. But I, when I read her question, it's it looked like she's been reading about some of the technical, you know. Uh, Def, you know, uh, descriptions of Vaidhi and Raganuga, um, you know, and do you, do you switch gears at a certain, <laughs> at a certain, you know, uh, I, I've always understood that, well, it's interesting, I've, I've read that different Gaudiya Vaishnava is not in Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's line, but some of them, you know, introduce Raganuga, like, you know, from day one. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding that in our line, it's, it, it's, generally said that at least you have to be on the platform, I believe, of Nishta mm -hmm. to, to even, you know, consider, um, not, it's not a switch over, but it's basically chapter, what is that verse number eight in the Nectar of Instruction? I, uh, um, I think uh, the essence of all advice is that one should mm -hmm. utilize one's full time, 24 hours a day, nicely chanting and remembering the Lord's divine name, transcendental form qualities and eternal pastimes. Thereby gradually engaging one's, mind, one's tongue and mind. In that way, one should reside in Braj and serve Krishna under the guidance of devotees. One should follow in the footsteps of the Lord's beloved devotees who are deeply attached to his devotional service. So I just thought I'd bring the, I just thought that she was kind of getting at the kind of the more technical uh, mm -hmm. side that you actually start meditating on. You know, you start to become gradually attracted to one of the Ragatmika devotees, et cetera. Yeah. And there's a, a quotation that Prabhim has, has uh, posted, sort of defining things. The, the way Srila Prabhupada taught, it's a, it's a maturity. Mm. It's not that first we do Vaidhi Bhakti and then we say, okay, I did Vaidhi Bhakti <laughs> and now I'm certified by the, the Vaishnavas or by my Guru Maharaj as being ready for, for, um, Raganuga uh, Bhakti. Uh, so now I'm, I'm going to switch gears. Not like that. But we follow, we follow, we follow, we follow. And we get a deeper realization. Uh, 
the same thing that was mechanical starts to become imbued with a kind of taste or it, it, a, a taste that was there is now realized. We didn't under, understand what it was, but you know, the beginning we were just chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, and you know, hoping that that somehow or other we would get some bliss or some some freedom, some relief, something would happen. We would become transcendental. Uh, so we were we were chanting, okay, that sixteen, yes, sixteen, all right. But then, as one advances, one starts to look forward to it. That I get to, I, you know, this is my time for chanting, uh, or even. Uh, it's difficult because I know my mind is going to wander, but still I, I, I look forward to this opportunity to sit and, and, and focus on the holy name. Or I look forward to being in the kirtan, I look forward to being, to preaching. The, even that, there was a famous exchange, Ramishar was sort of, what's the word, pumping book distribution in Los Angeles. And he, he's always intense and he's always, you know, when he pushes something, he's pushing it. So he was pushing book distribution. And, and in the course of his pushing, he said that the book distributors are in the mood of the gopis. Because the gopis are, uh, you know, bringing others to, to, to serve Krishna. So when you're distributing books, you're actually in the mood of the gopis. And some devotees thought, well, you know, come on. I mean, it's good that you're hyping book distribution, probably one of the books distributed, but this is like, this is getting a little much. So they wrote to Prabhupada that Ramishar is saying this and Prabhupada confirmed that yes, Ramishar is right. That this is the mood of the gopis to engage Others, if this a gopi is pleasing to Krishna, then the gopis, other gopis are pulling her forward. Come on, uh, and they're eager to see, happy to see others engaged in Krishna's service. So, the you know, you mean to say that by distributing books, you'll develop raganuga bhakti? Yes, <laughs> yes. Why? Uh, yasya prasadat bhagavat prasadat. If the spiritual master will be satisfied by distributing books, and if I dist by distribution of books, and if I distribute books, and the spiritual master is pleased, then Krishna is pleased. Then Krishna is pleased. Then you get mercy. It's not it's the same thing that the, even the book distribution starts off as a mechanical process. The the temple commander says. And at 11.30, we're all going to go out and distribute books. You say, oh, okay. Uh, how long? How long do we have to be out there? Uh, an hour and a half. Okay. But then you get a taste for it, and you're just always looking forward to the opportunity when you're going to meet someone, and you'll have, uh, there'll be someone receptive, and you'll have books, and you'll be able to distribute one or two or six or, or a set, it becomes enthusiasm. And that pleases Krishna, it pleases the spiritual master. It's not as some would say that it's that, oh, we're thinking that by karma you get bhakti, that it's just work, that you just do activities and you get no, it's not a mechanical thing. Krishna is pleased because you're sincerely trying to serve him. You're trying to serve the mission of Chaitanya the Mahaprabhu. So the spiritual master becomes pleased. Krishna becomes pleased. You, you make advancement. You get a taste for it. What do you want to do? You want to distribute more books. You want to preach more. Prabhupada said, because I was enthusiastic about hearing, his Guru Maharaj noted, this boy likes to hear. Now I'm enthusiastic about preaching. Shabhanam Kirtanam. And what is, you know, what, what's the essence of, of uh, Raga Nuga Bhakti? How does it, you know, again, it's this hearing and chanting, everything comes from, from the things that the neophyte does, but in the advanced stage. That's just the quote I just put there. And he continues to act 
as a neophyte. This is in the section on Raghunuga Bhakti and Nectar mm -hmm. Devotion. Mm -hmm. Along with the discharging of the regulative service, he thinks within himself of serving the Lord under the guidance of a particular associate of the Lord and develops his transcendental sentiments in following that associate. And Prabhupada always emphasized, this comes on its own. It's not that, it, that you, you suddenly decide, now I'm going to, you know, do this. But one develops eligibility uh, naturally. One natural by following the the path of devotional service with eagerness to have it in the association of pure devotees under proper guides. One comes to the mature stage. Uh, what is that? That anartha nivritti, the unwanted things start disappearing from the heart. Nishta, one becomes firmly uh, fixed up. One develops a taste. One develops attachment so these these things develop it's not um, that at a certain day we we do a raganuga initiation or something and say okay now you're ready and uh this and this and this and this Prabhupada's presentation was that by following the process of devotional service within the heart these things become revealed within the heart these things become Yes. Uh, and everything is, is achieved. That's the meaning of spontaneous devotional service, by the way. It's not uh, practiced. Uh, there, of course, there is practice within uh, Raga Nuga, but it's not that you can practice spontaneous devotional service. Uh, you, we practice following the regulative principles and so on. And the true consciousness of, of spontaneity develops. And then, yes, there are further principles to follow and, and so on. Well, what I really liked about that quote is that he says, we continue to act like a neophyte, which means continue act in body bhakti. It's not like you get sergeant stripes or something like that, or you start, you know, you don't, you, you wouldn't know a person you wouldn't know you don't know what a person's doing uh internally because externally they're acting like all the other sadhakas yeah and that's the difference between us and the sadhyas the sadhyas without even having the qualifications you know they want to to to, to show all the good stuff <laughs> you know so they're crying and they're you know whatever else it is that they're doing uh, but without having the real substance it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't have true meaning. It doesn't have true value. So the, yeah. So it's imp important. The, 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 the sadhus kind of want to wear it on their sleeve and, and show everyone. <laughs> but the advanced, the genuinely advanced devotees keep these things uh, private. Uh, they, they're not eager to uh, display. Their, their good fortune. Uh, they, sh they should, you know. So who was it that his line, his, his sadhana was like a line in the sand, in, in stone? Is that Raghunatha Goswami or Sanatana Goswami? One of the Goswamis that said his sadhana was like a line drawn in stone. Sadhana. And yet they were relishing a gopi bhavara samrita kinahidi kalona manoma. Uh, we're, we've officially run out of time. Uh, Raghunath Das Goswami, yeah, the Prayojana Acharya, the Acharya of, of devotional service and perfection of, of love of God, is practicing uh, sadhana in such a way that it's like a line drawn in, in stone. Undeviating sadhana. Yes, Nima. Um, how can we understand the prayer of Madhavendra Puri, where he seems to disregard everything? Goodbye, my morning bath. Goodbye, my religious practice. Goodbye, everything. I think it's sufficient that I just 
wherever I go, I can be in consciousness of Krishna now. How do we understand that in the light of what we've been discussing? He's especially talking about all the Vedic formula, uh, formularies, you know, that um, you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this and Om, 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 you know, all, all these rituals and, and, and so on. Um, the, and they take that to be, that's that spiritual life, you know, I, I take my morning bath, I chant my Gayatri, I do this, I do that. And it's very much a, a ritualistic uh, religious practice. And Madhavendra Puri is saying, no, that's not it. It's this, this attraction to Krishna. That's the, the Prema Pumartha Mahan, which is the real objective of the Vedas. Shramayavi uh, Kevalam, if we don't develop that attraction to Krishna, we're wasting our time. Uh, he, he's not saying, well, don't take your bath, don't ch chant your Gayatri Mantra. But he's, he's really saying that this is, this is not what my life is for. My life is for attraction to Krishna. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, we, well, let me just. There's a lot happening in, in the chat box here. I always like this point probably makes in the next devotion on Raganuva, so that's probably hard to lose point. And then there's um, Tulsi Priya has a question which we don't have time for. Does our spiritual master know which Ragatmika Bhakta his disciple follows? As Brother Bihari Prabhu was mentioning in certain Gaudiya branches I've even seen in Bengal. Um, I have no thoughts about that. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> Except that probably we don't give importance to those who are, you know, from day one. Your your uh, your name is such and such, and your your dress is such and such, and your service to Radha and Krishna is such and such, and your age is such. Um, that's not what Prabhupada taught us. Wasn't our Siddha Pranali Chinadapi Sunichana? Yes, yes, that's our Siddha Pranali Chinadapi Sunichana. Right. Thank you. And there's one last question. The definitions in of the Sanskrit in the Sanskrit Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Should we try to understand the terms Raga, Ragatmika? Yes, they're there for our understanding. I can recommend, by the way, those who are studying nectar of devotion, if you study it along with this with the study guide written by His Holiness Dhanadar Swami, uh, Waves of Devotion. It provides a really um, excellent. Um, insight uh, it really helps you understand what Srila Prabhupada is, is writing. Very chaste commentary on nectar of devotion, uh, but full of insights, full of um, clarification. So if you're studying nectar of devotion, study it along with waves of devotion by His Holiness Dhanakar Swami. Okay. Um, and poor Kamalini says, and uh, I sell it if anyone's interested. So if he sells everything. <laughs> no, she sells that she sells selected. Books yeah, selected good uh, good things. I mean everything good. Yes, everything good. Anything good you're looking <laughs> for, go to a poor man and Kamalini. So you can get Dunadam Rush's book from, from her. And we can end here. This is Vaidhi to uh, follow the rules and regulations <laughs> and something like on time. Thank you all very much. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.
Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Thank you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. 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 Thank you.